Okay, so we'll go live here. And now, um, first thing we want to say is thank you, everyone, so much for all of your prayers and your support. I mean, we can't thank you enough. I mean, we heard so many stories of people just laboring in prayer and sacrificing in prayer, your time. And uh, we so appreciate your, your prayers, uh, your donations. Just um, you don't understand how important prayer is until you're over there. And you realize, okay, you, you could just, you know, I, I saw you could feel the presence of God and you could feel answered prayer. But especially on the safari, we just were like, okay, God is really answering prayer. So thank you so much for your prayers um, and all you did to help us. So I don't know if you guys want to say anything about that. Too, well, just but. a big amen to that. I mean, we, we really depended upon your prayers and uh, we, we felt them very much. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. One thing, and we may get into this later on too, but one thing that was just so evident there was this is a body thing, not a one or two people thing. Yeah. And not just with, like, even in, in, within life school itself, every single person has a very important part to play. And collectively, <clears throat> it makes a very strong, organ, you know, movement organization um, and that's true here too for, you know, the ones who stayed back and prayed, like it's not, it's not like a lesser thing. Like it's, it's probably the most important of, of everything that goes on and just, you know, it's cool because of what God's doing, every single person has a part to play if they want to. Um, and it's a powerful part. It's not, oh, okay, we're just going to pray. No, there's, there's, it, there's real power behind that. So again, thank you, um, so much for your prayer it, it's technology is great because like one text away and it's like hey pray for this and it's like okay we have you know 20 people praying for something which is is amazing yeah um it is amazing and so uh, one of the things i want to do first for those that might be listening online that don't know why what life school the mission of life school what it's about just want to just real quickly share the mission uh, you know, Revelation 19.7 talks about uh, the bride, his bride has made herself ready. And, you know, the, the mission of this church is to make the bride of Christ ready in this church, city, nation, and the nations. And Life School is helping to fulfill that, and especially in the nation of Africa. And th the way I like to say it is we're transforming the church in Africa one pastor at a time. And just, just want to real quickly give you just a couple examples of of the, some of the problems that are going on in the church in Africa and how Life School is helping to solve those problems. Like, uh, just, I'll just go through a couple here. But one of the problems we, we hear about often in Africa is so much of it is centered around the man of God in Africa. You got to go to the man of God to get a healing. You got to go to the man of God to get a prophecy. You got to go to the man of God. Uh, you can't really have your own relationship with God. That's, that is really prevalent in the Church of Africa. And so, you know, the hearing, you know, we have a class called Learning to Hear God's Voice, and that class really helps uh, believers learn they can hear God for themselves. They don't have to just go through to Jesus Christ through the man of God. They can hear God's voice for themselves. And that, that class is, is changing so many people's lives in Africa. Um, just a couple other ones. Uh, the, the, uh, the prosperity gospel is really, really bad in Africa. If you think it's bad here, it's, 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 you know, what happens is people in Africa watch Christian TV and they watch Christian TV and they see the prosperity gospel preached on Christian TV, but then they take it to a whole nother extreme. I mean, it, it is bad. And, and, you know, just talking to them, a lot of churches are just focused on, um, you, every single Sunday you go and you get a prophecy. Every single Sunday you go and you get deliverance. But there's no real grounding in the Word of God, grounding in God's purpose. And so the eternal purpose class really helps people know, okay, this is God's ultimate intention. And so, you know, those different things are really showing you, you know, how life school is specifically designed to bring transformation to the church in Africa, one pastor at a time. I'll share one more story if you guys want to share anything. Um, we heard uh, Evan Souza told us, he's one of our leaders, and he told us a story, and I don't even know if I told you guys this, but he told us a story. I was recording for about six out, four to six hours on Saturday, all these different testimonies for a video we're going to do, 
And Evan Souza was telling us that out in Western Kenya, in really remote places, the, um, the pastor was making their church come and uh, go, go up front at the beginning of every church service, and they had to repent of the, individually of every sin. So basically the pastor was like a Catholic priest, and the, and the people had to come up and confess their sins to the priest, I mean to the pastor. And then when he was done, he took animal blood and sprinkled it on them and said, now your sins have been forgiven. And so um, the, that pastor, when he went through life school, uh, was really changed and impacted and, you know, really saw the error of his ways. I mean, we heard so many of those kind of stories, even the, uh, even, uh, remember the Jesus Christ, there was a guy and were you there? I don't know if you were there. Yeah, yeah. You want to share that? Funny. Yeah, you can share that. Yeah, there's some, this is a r remote area of Western Kenya and there was some guy there that had a pretty good size following and he said that he was Jesus Christ, uh, uh, that he was. And so there were a lot of people doing all kinds of things. And so uh, one year on Easter, I guess last year, I don't know, on Easter, the people in the village who didn't agree with this guy decided they were going to go crucify him. And so, <laughs> and so they, they, were, they were going after him to, to crucify him. And he ran to the police, and uh, he was, wasn't crucified. But I thought it was pretty yeah. interesting, pretty funny. I mean, you, we heard so many stories, yeah. so many different stories. But I don't, I don't know if you guys want to add anything else. Um, you know, just we'll start now. Just, you know, maybe you guys can give us some of your overall thoughts of... Uh, you Could know, I maybe share about yeah. the objective? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I think one thing that would maybe help us understand kind of why we te taught what we did. Uh, the Lord, before we went, gave us like four objectives for the time together with the mentors. I mean, we, we gathered, I think there were 35 regional leaders that were there, and we met with them from Monday through Sunday, uh, 9 in the morning to six, 5 or 6 at night, uh, we had a little, we only went to noon on Saturday and we had just a service that went to like one on Sunday uh, or so. So we gathered them for quite a bit of time. Uh, but the Lord gave us four objectives for that. The first one was to secure the vessel and, uh, you know, the forerunner vessel, the, the overall feeling is that God is raising up a, a forerunner vessel, a uh, company of people John the Baptist, uh, Spirit and Power of Elijah, the things that I think we all are aware of, who will then prepare the bride. Uh, and so the, the mentors, uh, some are functioning, were fun, are fun, have been and are functioning in that, as, a, as that vessel, but a lot of others are, were uh, more in, in the line of Bible material distributors than they were a real forerunner in the sense of preparing the bride. And so the Lord gave us that objective to secure that company of people uh, in order to be a true forerunner, to transition them from a Bible material distributor to a true forerunner who would be uh, preparing uh, the other pastors as a bride. So that was the first objective. The second objective was to lay a foundation uh, for what the vessel, the forerunner company needs to understand, foundational teachings, truths, so that we know they know what they need to, to teach and to have in their heart so they can be that voice into the larger church. So that was a lot of the teaching was a line around that theme of uh, laying that foundation. Uh, and then the third objective was to come up with a new process to implement life school that would take it to a new level based on uh, where we sense uh, the world is and what God wants to do uh, through that vessel. And then the fourth one was to lead them to a time of commitment and uh, impartation so that they could be trained and then run with. So anyway, those were the four objectives. Yeah, you got anything to add overall thoughts, Michael? Okay, yeah, just jump in. So, 
you know, from my, my perspective, overall thoughts, um, by the way, I know we asked people to follow us on social media, on Instagram, and we posted one update and didn't post any more. It was so incredibly busy that we didn't have any time whatsoever to even make a post. But, uh, you know, maybe you can show the slide of how to follow us on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, we are going to make um, some posts of Instagram and Facebook next week, sharing details of the days and pictures and all that stuff. So anyway, make sure to follow us on Instagram, make sure to follow us on Facebook, and you can see that, uh, are the links up there, or is it showing? Okay, cool. Okay, so overall thoughts, I think this is the most important trip we've ever done. Um, one of the things I think is, is the hardest thing to do is to come back and accurately explain and articulate what God's doing because it's like stepping into the book of Acts. And it's like you're going from what's going, all that's going on in America and you're stepping right in to a, I believe one, one of the great revivals at the end of the age that's just multiplying throughout Africa. And it's like you're going into the book of Acts. They're hungry and they're thirsty. Uh, Things are multiplying, it's just going all over the place into the, you know, and we'll talk about this later, but remote places and it's revival, it's multiplication, it's church growth. Um, all these things, it, it's like stepping in the book of Acts and, you know, it's so hard to come back here and explain it. You know, we're going to try our best, but to explain it. But, you know, it's one of those things, it's like, wow, um, it, it's, it's just amazing. Um, one of the things that really impressed me was after 20 years, we have a team now um, of about 35 leaders from 10 nations that really seem like they're on the same page. Um, and they're eager to be forerunners. They're eager to be trained and equipped as forerunners. And when we mean forerunners, they're basically being going before the people and they're, they're making themselves ready for the Lord. And then they're making the bride ready for the Lord and all that means, bringing transformation. But to, to see we have such a un, united team member is, is really, really encouraging. Um, the, the other thing that really stood out to me was this is, this is a prophetic and apostolic team we have. And what I mean prophetic, they're, they're being equipped as true messengers of the Lord um, to proclaim the testimony of Jesus Christ as a, as a messenger and to be apostolic in the sense that they're going out and they're planting a transforming work there. And it's just, like I said, it's, it's like you're stepping into the New Testament. Um, but it's so encouraging that everyone seems to be, for the most part, united in purpose on this one mission to make the bride ready in Africa. Um, very encouraging. So I don't know if you guys want to add anything to that. So, so one thing when we were there, I think it was earlier in the week, there was a word that came forth about how, you know, the, the scripture where it's the first will be last and the last will be first, right? And, and so in the, in, the, in the eyes of the world, Africa's last. There's the last to get stuff. They get all the hand me down, you know? So like they are last according to the world, but according to the Lord, they're going to be first in this last move of God, right? So like what God is, is, is doing there is going to spread through the whole earth. And so I don't know if it was that night or the next night I couldn't sleep. And um, it was just like, I couldn't sleep. It was like download from like the Lord um, about one of the videos we're going to be making related to fundraising, kind of telling the life school story. And, and in that, um, the Lord kind of gave me a, an idea of how to communicate what's basically what I just said. And, and how, like, we have these little, whether it's going to be like a vine or a, I think it end up at like a fire, like little fires, like in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Like, Uganda and Kenya are, like, where it's strongest. Tanzania, we have leaders there. But that's, it's, it's um, you know, those, those are kind of like the three main countries. But then it's spreading. Like, in Uganda, it's spreading into Sudan, which is that when we heard this, we were like, Wow. That is really cool. It's going into civil Sudan. Civil wars going yeah. breaking and it's in Sudan. Yeah, yeah, civil wars in Sudan. There's a lot of refugees there. It's a Sudan is like probably one of the hardest countries on the planet. Um, but they're going there. Like we're we're not gonna go on a mission trip to Sudan. We'd probably get killed, right? But for them to do it, like they're they're wired that way. And and so, 
anyway, so I saw these, like, th these fires, and um, it's like, it's going to spread throughout Africa, and then it's going to go into other continents, like Asia, and uh, South America, and, 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 and ultimately America and the Western world. Um, and it was interesting, I think, I think when we were, when we were on our way, maybe when we were in Nairobi before we were going to leave, someone had mentioned a prophetic word that was spoken about Kenya back in like the 90s where this particular person saw like arrows of fire being shot from Kenya to other parts of the world. And so basically Kenya was going to be used um, to, to spark a revival. And I was like, wow, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty cool confirmation. Yeah. Okay. And so when you think about that, you're like, wow, what are these like nobodies that God is using in this movement? Which is like, so when, when you think about, okay, my prayers, what am I praying for? What am I giving for? That's what you're giving for. That's what you're praying for. So what is starting there is going to spread. And, and so like, ha like realizing that and having ownership in that is a very cool and, and powerful thing. It, it, I think it gives a sense of, of, of purpose. I mean, obviously we have purpose in other things too. You know, we're not just, that's not just the only thing we're called in, but, but when you know, like, I, I'm part of this, like I could be part of this last, this, this great end time move of the Holy Spirit that is going to impact hundreds of millions, potentially people. And I have a part to play in that. It, it's, it's very, uh, it's a very humbling, but it's also very like, man, Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be part of this. Yeah. Like, wow, it's such an honor. Yeah, and it's a revival that, like Michael said, it's a revival that's spreading from Kenya to other parts of Africa, to other parts of the world. But it's a revival that's, that's I believe the Lord is going to use to make the bride ready. Yeah. It's, it's a bride, not just bridal a revival. revival. Yeah, bridal revival that's, that's going to make the bride ready in Africa. So it's not just like a revival where people get touched and, you know, 10 years later, the effects are gone. It's a, it's, a, it's a revival, I believe, part of the Lord's end time work to make the bride ready in Africa. Um, when, one of the nights when Michael was not sleeping, um, I had a dream and I saw this like big hand reach down right near my face and it woke me up and... I found out later that Michael was actually physically <laughs> touching my bed, and uh, I couldn't go back to sleep. I, I was like up the rest of the night. I so, think. give me give you context. <laughs> like the, the mattress was like so hard. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, why is like I, I was sore. And I'm like, man, is are their mattresses hard too? And so, <laughs> I was like, okay, Brian was facing the other way. I mean, there's a good like foot and a half between the edge of the mattress and his back. Let me just touch the mattress real quick to see the firmness. And like right when I did, he had that dream and looked over and I was like, you know, <laughs> and he didn't know, yeah. he didn't know I did that until the next morning. Yeah. I told him. And I don't think I went back to sleep, but maybe I did. I don't know. But yeah. Um, one of the things that was, one of the things that was really, uh, one of the things we did is it went to the beginnings of high school. Maybe you can show the picture of the cool shade hotel. Uh, we got a picture of Dad and Moses at the Cool Shade Hotel. So, uh, and yeah. if uh, if you we we went into the place where the conference was held, and man, the first a, conference, the first conference was held in 2003. Yeah, 2003. Yeah, yeah maybe Donna you want to share about that just real quick in that. Yeah, day. yeah. Well, so. it was um, you know this was a 20th year basically. We're starting the 21st year of Life School, and uh, the place where we were meeting this year. We're just right down the road from the Cool Shade Hotel, which was where we had our first conference in 2003. And Donna and I were there. And we, that's when we met Moses. He was uh, somebody, another girl that was interpreting uh, the, the, the messages and she couldn't understand us or whatever. And so Moses happened to be there for the conference and he came up and, uh, and took over interpreting. And that's where we met him and his wife, Prisca, was leading some of the worship, uh, and she ended up singing prophetically uh, about preparing the way and all that fit right into the call. So that's how we met there. But it was definitely humble. Seeing the cool shade 20 years later, it was definitely humble beginnings. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was uh, uh, quite the uh, 
place, I guess, to, yeah. to start. Yeah. yeah. So. Anyway, so um, now when we get there on Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon, we had a leadership team meeting, and I'll just show you a couple pictures. Of we got six mem six members on our leadership team. Just we'll show you uh, and just give you a quick description of each one. Moses Achola, uh, he's from Kenya. Uh, Moses really is an excellent preacher, excellent communicator. Really has the message in his heart. Uh, I think he he over I think he's planted is it seven churches. He's planted. So. Seven churches. Um, really, really a man of God and uh, really blessed to have Moses on the team. Uh, the next person you'll, you're seeing here is Ezekiel Abele. Is that how you say his last name? Abele? 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 Uh, Ezekiel is in, from Mombasa, which is, a, which is about half Muslim, half Christian. Um, really, uh, a, a great work is going on in Mombasa. There, the the leadership, the team in Mombasa is just is taking it out uh, to many different places in Mombasa, and Ezekiel really has this message in his heart. Um, the next one is Evans Souza, and Evans is uh, he he's a really funny guy. <laughs> Ezekiel and Evans are really funny. They're they're both really funny guys, and Evans is taking it out to Evans is the one who told us the story about the animal blood. Uh, he also is taking it out to this place called Turkana, which is 10 hours from where he lives. And it is in, it is in the mo one of the most remote places in the earth. If you've ever seen those National Geographic pictures, it's where, you know, where they don't have clothes on. That's where he's taking life school. Um, it's crazy. But Evans has a real heart to take it out to remote places and the forgotten pastors there. And then you have also Paul Musungu, who's out in western Kenya. And he's taking it out to very, very remote places. He has a, such a heart to take the, the life school material out to what they call the forgotten pastor that no one even thinks about. And he, he's taken it to places where cars can't even go. And we've been out there before. And I mean, it, it is very, very remote. Um, next, you have Uganda. Maybe, Michael, you talk about Derek. And then, Dad, after that, you talk about uh, Andrew. Yeah, so Derek. Think of Derek as a highly educated, very intelligent um, person who is on fire and hungry and for growth and for probably, like if we could like rank all the people, they're like hunger and focus and excitement about, he's on, he's in the top. Like he is just, he's so passionate about this and he's taken it. Like, um, you know, he, He's he's bivocational, and so he's you know we're not having to support like he's he's ra he's doing a lot of this on his own, um, but he's he's raised up a team there. I think there's what five four, four, others. four others. Okay, so yeah, so he's a fifth. So four others, and and you can just see there's just a depth of of the other mentors. There's a um, um, just just such a. It, it, like I, I got the opportunity to speak to or to hang out with one of them that lives kind of near Sudan, and just the depth of uh, character and hunger and how God's using them. It's like you know Derek's basically has discipled him. So um, yeah, he's just he's a he's a he's an individual with with tremendous character. I know he knows Doug um, really well. I know he's been here a few times, but. Um, you know, I'm going to be working with Derek and Paul a lot over the next several years. So, um, yeah, it's a high honor to, to be working with him. Yeah, and, and Derek's taking life school. One of the things we found out is the bigger cities are receiving life school less eagerly than the remote places are because they're so busy. So Derek is taking life school out into northern Uganda. If you've heard of Joseph Kony, I don't know if you've heard of Joseph Kony, where he was... He led the Lord's resistance army. It was not of the Lord. It was a very terroristic organization that just did so much damage to northern Uganda. And the people there had been devastated. And uh, Derek is taken out to northern Uganda. And there's just massive opportunity into northern Uganda. And what they're saying, too, is some of the South Sudanese refugees are coming from South Sudan into northern Uganda. And they're training and equipping them. And they're sending them back to South Sudan. I mean, it, it's just like blows your mind. You're sitting there going, you know, like just blowing your mind what God's doing. Just, just, just really blows your mind. Um, 
what the Lord's doing with that. And then we also have our leader, Andrew Mdoy from Tanzania, and maybe you could share about Andrew. Uh, yeah, Andrew Mdoy, uh, is, he's in, lives in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, um, and he oversees the team there and the work there in Tanzania. Uh, I think we have six, uh, four that are existing mentors, and uh, we, he brought two others, two new ones, so six, oversees six other mentors there in Tanzania. Tanzania is a really a big a big country, I think a lot bigger even than Kenya or Uganda. Uh, and so there's a lot of travel there that he does. He's a real uh, man of prayer, a uh, real intercessor uh, type of guy. And so he's a, uh, we've known him for close to 20 years, not quite that long, but close to that. Yeah, so just, um, just overall, it's, it, um, this is the first time we've set up a leadership team and um, of these six leaders. And this is really hugely bl a blessing because these, these guys, for the most part, really have the message in their hearts. Most of them can preach it better than we can, For just being honest. They, they've got it in their heart, and then when you hear them preach it, you're like, okay, they're, they're, they're very good preachers. Um, and it's, it's so encouraging just to, you know, when we met with them on that Sunday, just to see, okay, we got, we got a really good team right now of godly, intelligent, anointed, wise, gifted, talented men of God, uh, different personalities, different cultures, different nations represented, but just to see, okay, these guys are going to oversee the other mentors to make sure, okay, that they've really, really got this and people are being trained and equipped. So anyway, that was, yeah. yeah. Well, we, we, the purpose of meeting with them, in addition to putting them in kind of a leadership position, was that we really felt that we, we must come up with a different strategy, a new wine skin for life school because of the need for a new wine skin in the church in this hour. And so uh, we uh, were working with them to come up with a new process that we ended up presenting to the entire group on Friday. Uh, we were, we had come up with a, our proposal to start with and then we worked with them over the week to cut to, to tweak it and come up with actually a little bit different of a plan. But uh, so that was the purpose of that first meeting, one of the purposes of it. And then, uh, so now we'll, I'm gonna show just a picture of the, uh, the all the people that were the, the 35 or so leaders from the 10, well only nine nations came, one South Africa leader couldn't come. But maybe you can show that picture of that, the team there, the the 35 people that attended the conference and, um, you know, just talking to them, really impressed with them, um, very impressed with the people that attended. It's very encouraging. They're hungry. They're, they're asking great questions. They can, they're anointed. Um, they, they love the Lord. They're godly. And, uh, very, very impressed. Um, that doesn't mean we don't. There's not some work to do. There is some work to do to to really make sure they've they've got the message and they're just not just staying on, hearing God's voice and worship. But but very impressed overall with everyone there. Their hunger level. Everyone seemed to to receive it and um, ask great questions. You, you can tell when they ask their questions. Okay, they're very thoughtful. They're very they understand things. They're very much um, articulate and and what they're talking about. So, you know, that, that, was, that was a very encouraging scene where they're at there. Um, then the first day, Monday, we talked about, the, the focus of Monday was understanding the forerunner call. So that maybe you can share kind of like a high level overview of what we talked about on Monday. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, the, the way we approached the, uh, each day was we came up with like five or six themes that messengers, forerunners need to really have in their heart if they're going to really be a voice, if they're, if they're going to be transition from uh, being a Bible material distributor to a true messenger, a voice. Uh, and so we, we took one theme a day uh, to, uh, to communicate to them and to teach them the foundational truths of, of that. And so uh, Monday, like Brian said, was the forerunner call, the messengerial call, for them to get an understanding of what's really involved in this messengerial call. Uh, and so um, uh, Brian talked about raising an Elijah army, which was basically he went into a lot of the biblical foundation for the 
reality that there is a forerunner call, there is a messengerial call, going from in Malachi and other places, Malachi 3 and 4 uh, and other places. And then uh, Michael talked about the th four functions of the forerunner, uh, of being a messenger who would be a voice to invite people into the new wineskin, uh, and then the master builder who would then take uh, and train and equip those who said yes to it, uh, intercessors who would pray into the uh, into the, uh, the issue of a, building a different type of church based on God's eternal purpose, and then friends of the bridegroom who would uh, speak the same thing but in the context of the bride being made ready. So Michael talked about that. And then I talked about the need for the forerunners that some of the things that are going on in the world, some of the things that God's speaking into the church uh, in terms of new things in preparation for the second coming of Christ and the need for a new wineskin in the church, especially we focus on the church in Africa, like Brian had said earlier about the, uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, eras in the African church and there was a new wineskin so that a spiritual environment can be made, can be created in churches so that a bride can be made ready. Right now, a lot of the church in Africa, as it is in America, <clears throat> there's no spiritual environment in the church to even make a bride ready. And so we talked about the need for that and how uh, forerunners are needed uh, to create uh, a spiritual environment, to speak into the church, to transform the spiritual environment uh, so that a bride can be made ready. And so that was the goal kind of, of Monday to go into those is issues. Yeah, and you know, it, just, just if, you, if you're unfamiliar with the term forerunner, just to take it from Luke 1, 17 and through 18, at the first coming of Jesus, uh, you know, scholars say there's about 500,000 people in Judea at the time of Jesus. And John, uh, the Lord raised up John the Baptist. It said he was a forerunner in the spirit and the power of Elijah anointed to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so God raised up one messenger to prepare Israel for the first coming of Jesus. But you think about the second coming, there's 8 billion people in the world. God needs many John the Baptist messengers all over the world to make ready the church for the second coming of Jesus Christ to um, make the bride ready. Like Revelation 19, 7 through 8 talks about the bride who made herself ready. But there's also messengers, the John the Baptist type messengers, like John the Baptist, anointed by the Holy Spirit to make the, the bride ready um, before the second coming of Jesus. And we were talking about the need for that in Africa especially. And so I think that was very well received. I think they understood it. Yeah, yeah, they understood it, it and they were excited about it. Yeah. Well, one just point, make sure we understand. When we use the term forerunners, messengers, the vessel, uh, in a sense, we're speaking uh, about the same thing. Yeah. It's just different what terms to, to, to speak of the same issue. A group of people who are going before the larger church uh, to, to uh, make them ready as a bride for Christ before his second coming. Yep. Okay. Uh, anything else about Monday you want to share? Okay, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, we, our focus on Tuesday was God's eternal purpose, and that went really well. Just to, and just again, to, to clarify, is God's, getting the right starting point is very important, that God did not start in the book of Genesis. This is kind of new for some. God did not start in the book of Genesis with the fall and say, salvation is God's ultimate intention. The starting point is actually Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, that God had an eternal purpose, eternal plan before time and creation that was greater than salvation that would have happened whether or not Adam and Eve fell or did not fall. And we talked about that, what God's ultimate intention is. It's not just to save us, though that's obviously vital. It's not just to make disciples. It's not just to glorify him. All those are very important, but God's ultimate intention was to... Uh, and Michael, maybe you, you want to go into the five components. You remember those, or at least uh, go into the ones you remember. Yeah. Okay. So, so the five. This will be a test. This will be a test. See if you get trail. By the way, we brought uh, trail mix from Costco, and we would ask them questions, and they, man, they love the trail mix. So. Yeah. So yeah. G. Uh, so 
I guess I spoke on the preeminency of Christ, of, you know, Christ is the center of everything. Um, Brian talked about the, uh, the father's inheritance of mature Christ-like sons, um, son's inheritance of an equally yoked bride, and the Holy Spirit would have a, a temple, of, you know, um, and then the believers, the rewards of eternal intimacy, authority, and, and eternal glory. Hey, you would get trail mix for that. I would get trail mix. That's good. I, That's good. Maybe y'all yeah. can get a cosmetic. I, ha I have notes here too, but I, I think I still could have done it without yeah. notes. He got the five components. So that went really, I thought that went really well. Um, I think that really like changed their perspective to realize, and, and every, every time anyone ever hears it, and when they realize, okay, God's ultimate intention is not salvation. God's ultimate intention is not to glorify himself. You know, all that we've been taught for so long in the church, all those are important, but God had an even greater purpose, the, his ultimate intention, uh, his eternal plan and purpose. And when you understand that, and you, what, it, what it really did was to show people how much, and you could say the same thing in America, but in Africa, how much of the church is so focused on your best life now, the prosperity gospel, God, God is so interested in blessing you and healing you and giving you a prophetic word and giving you a deliverance and giving you a better house or a better car. And don't get me wrong, God wants to bless us, but that, God did not create us just to bless us. It's for his good pleasure. Um, it's for the Godhead's good pleasure and what they wanted in an, in an inheritance in his people. It's not just about our inheritance in Jesus Christ is about God's inheritance in us. That is at the utmost importance. And making that shift, I thought, really, really um, helped them, you know, make, you know, and they've been through that, but just really helped them make that shift from what really is at the forefront of God's intention and purpose, what he's really trying to do. And once you understand God's purpose, you can find your purpose in his purpose so that you're not out of alignment with what God wants to do. Because so much of the church in Africa, so much of the church in America is out of alignment um, from what God ultimately wants that's revealed in the book of Ephesians. So I, I think that, that really helped them, uh, you know, change their perspective, I think. I don't know if you guys want to say anything on that. Uh, well, at the end of, uh, I guess it was the end of your second, you did two messages on it. At the end yeah. of that, there was a real move of uh, prayer and uh, commitment and yeah, understanding. That, that was really, yeah. really powerful. Yeah. And so we did that. And then... That was the, probably the strongest sense of God's presence. Yeah. Uh, Tuesday yeah, was, uh, and Sunday, but may, maybe Tuesday even stronger. Yeah, really Tuesday strong might have been the strongest presence. one. And so I was supposed to speak after that. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, and it, that was really, really hard. Um, so I decided I, I really it was important concepts, but, uh, you know, uh, if you think you guys sleep a lot when we are tired, when, when we speak, uh, this was really, uh, hard, but I, I felt like I needed to do it anyway. But so I took the, uh, how I, I spoke a little bit on how God's eternal purpose needs to impact the church. Cause we're talking to pastors, uh, in terms of creating the spiritual environment. I wanted to try, we wanted to try to keep coming back to Look, you've got to create a new environment in the churches you lead. You can't just, you know, have these teachings over here and still teach in the same way you've been teaching forever. You've got to create a different spiritual environment. And so I took each of the five aspects of eternal purpose and said, okay, this aspect, how should it impact your teaching? This aspect, how should it impact? Uh, and I had to do it really, really quick, or they would have really probably rebelled. But anyway, we we did it, and uh, uh, to try to get that on uh, in the video at least, so they could really kind of understand that. And then uh, on Wednesday, oh yeah, okay, go ahead. Yep. Just one one little story on Tuesday. Um, Brian and I had a sensing of the Lord for a word for Ezekiel that he was called as a lion, right, and. In the context of what that means is, think of, uh, you know, Jesus is called the Lamb of God, but also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the Alpha, he's the Omega. And in, in, the, in the, the, the Omega ministry, the end, right, where we're at, he's going to be, he's going, he, he's going to be showing himself as the Lion, 
right? And, um, you know, we were, I was kind of thinking about that a little bit before we went and how the lion is really representing of that apostolic kingly authority. And so, um, you know, we, we, Brian and I both felt that for Ezekiel. And, and so we, in, in Swahili, lion is Simba. So it's kind of like, you know, Simba to us is like a little cartoon character, right? So it's kind of like, we call we called him Simba the whole time, which it, it kind of did, you know, t t diluted it a little bit, but it's funny because he's just a big, he's just like a big old teddy bear and calling him Simba the whole time, but yeah. Yeah, it was good. Uh, on Wednesday, we talked about um, salvation and eternal rewards. Again, this is huge there because, you know, I just mentioned that one thing about animal blood, you know, forgiving your sins. There really, in Africa, is a, a real lack of understanding of the doctrine of salvation, um, you know, justification, sanctification, glorification. Uh, they were, they were you, you could just tell in the questions they asked how interested they were, you know, just, you know, what it means when Paul said, we are saved, we are being saved, we will be saved. Justification relates to how your spirit was transformed when you were born again. Sanctification relates to how your soul is being transformed as you're becoming more like Christ. Glorification relates to how your body will be changed at the resurrection. Uh, justification delivers you from the penalty of sin. Sanctification delivers you from the power of sin. Uh, glorification delivers you from the pollution or the presence of sin. Um, and just went through that and, um, and you, you just tell really great questions they were asking. Um, we're gonna, that's gonna be a new one of our classes that will happen when we roll out the new version of the, of the school uh, in, a, in a year or so. But uh, I, I thought that went real well. And then Michael taught on eternal rewards. That was, Michael did an excellent job. Uh, really, really good. Um, a, there, there's such a lack of teaching. And this, I would say this in America too. There's such a lack of teaching on the judgment seat of Christ and eternal rewards. And because of that, it, a lot of, one of the reasons why Paul taught on the judgment seat of Christ to the Corinthians is because they were, they were living carnal, fleshly lives. They were saved, they were justified, they were going to heaven, but they lived in carnality because they did not have a vision of the judgment seat of Christ. And, you know, that there will be people that will receive the full reward that God offers, and there will be people that will make it in only through fire. And Michael did a great job explaining the eternal rewards, the judgment seat of Christ, and it was a new teaching for them, for a lot of them. Um, and so we're going to actually have a whole class on that as well. But I don't know, maybe you want to say anything about that. Yeah, yeah so one of the guys, uh, the leaders, in Z one of the Zambian guys came up to me afterwards and was just like, you could just tell, he's like, whoa, whoa. Like, I didn't, I never thought about that. And it was just like this, like, moment, right? And I felt compassion because I was like, I was there. Like, I had to sit, the, what you're feeling right now, I had the same thing. And, you know, it was just one of those things where it was like a holy fear of the Lord. Back when, when I had that understanding, it was like a holy fear of the Lord, but it was clean. Because it brought, it brought clarity. It brought um, a sense of purpose, right? And it kind of it removed a lot of the clutter. And I could see that that was going on with him, too. Um, so it was cool. It was like, wow. Like, Basically, you're going through now what I went through too, and you know there's fruit there. So I was I was very blessed to see that. I, I think again, people receive like there was a, there was a reception of it, um, which was awesome. Yeah. So, Dad, anything else to add on salvation? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, good job. Uh, strategy session in the afternoon. A lot of people there they zone out. This is the most most important thing I think because one of the most important things because. If you don't get the right strategy, you won't get the right results. And I think, you know, we had a lot of prayer. Thank you so much for your prayers. We had a lot of prayer that God would give us the right strategy. And the basic challenge we were running into um, in Africa, though we, we've trained 10,000, about 10,000 pastors in, you know, in, in uh, 10,000 pastors in 10 years. No, no, 14 years. Since 2010, we've trained about 10,000 pastors. Uh, one of the challenges we've had is the mentors themselves are really have a good grasp on hearing God's voice in the worshiping church, but they haven't moved 
move beyond those two classes. Of, I mean, a good number of them, some have, but, but a good number have just camped out at hearing God and worship. And so we really needed these, these leaders to not, like Dad mentioned, to not just be Bible, Bible school distributors of materials, but to be messengers that, that own it and can mentor. We, we need to bring up the level of mentoring. And so I felt like we got a really good strategy that we developed with our leadership team, the six leaders, and communicated that on, on Wednesday. And, you know, we, you, you could tell. What's that? On Friday. Oh, we communicated on Friday? Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we met oh, with the leadership team on Wednesday. On Wednesday. Yeah. on Wednesday, that's right. We we met with the leadership team on Wednesday. We we nailed it down, and we communicated on Friday. But um, but very very encouraging that basically from about March of 2024 to 2025, we're going to be we're going to be equipping the leadership team. Us three are going to be equipping the leadership team. They're going to be equipping the other the other 30 or so leaders. And then, you know, making sure they're messengers and not just distributors of materials, making sure that better mentoring is going on. And we're going to take a year or so to really let them own the message, to know the message, own the message, live the message before they proclaim and multiply it. Because they, they just kind of wanted to move right straight to multiplying it instead of knowing it, uh, owning it, living it, proclaiming it, and then multiplying it. And so just, I think that's going to be a, a real blessing. And we'll start back another cycle in 2025. I don't know if y'all want to say anything about the strategy. Uh, no, no, I, I think it's not point going through the details of it. But uh, yeah, it's a very good point. I think the one thing for our, our prayer support for that, the Lord gave me the parable of the four soils, the parable of the sower. Uh, and I think it's the challenge for them now is going to be those th first three soils so they can get actually to the fourth soil. The one they don't have understanding and therefore they fought, the enemy steals it from them. They got to really dig in to get understanding. The second one is uh, because of they receive it with joy, but when the opposition comes to the message, uh, as they begin to speak it around their church, they could fall away. And the third one is the cares of the world. Uh, just steal it. So we got to pray. We really have to pray uh, for this next year, really, that uh, they'll really persevere and get this message in their hearts. On um, Thursday, we taught on the Bride of Christ. And so Dad taught on Matthew 22, Michael on Matthew 25. I taught on Revelation 19, 7 through 9. Uh, taught on the four main views of the overcomers. But uh, yeah, that that was, that was too late in the afternoon to teach on that because they, they zoned out. So, um, but, you know, really trying to explain to them, okay, the bride has to make herself ready. That justification and being born again is not enough to be ready as a bride and really explaining what that means and stuff like that. And uh, w one of the things that, that really hit me when we were going through that, I think it was probably when Dad was talking about Matthew 22 is, is that he sent the slaves out on the highways and byways and compelled them to come in. And I think we heard this story, oh, we've heard this, I don't know, five times at least, where the bigger cities are more, the bigger cities are so busy, they're not really, they're not resistant to it, but they're not as nearly as eager and hungry to get the message. They're more, e they'd be more eager to get the diploma, but not to get the message. But the most of these, this message is going out into the remote, uh, what do they call it, the uh, interior. They call it the interior, the, the places where cars can't even go. I mean, you would just, you know, we, we couldn't even go there. We would not be able to even go there. But just, it, it blew me away to see how in, um, in Luke chapter 14, when the Lord said, when you give a banquet, invite the poor. And just to see that, this message was being sent out into these places that you can even, you can even fathom where it's going. It blew my mind away how God was sending it out into the byway, highways and byways to the most remote places where they're really are hungry and really are thirsty, um, and they're 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 responding to that invitation. So that that really hit me on Thursday. How God is just just really. I was so blessed by that, um, how it was going out to the remote places. I don't know, Michael, maybe you want to explain what some of those remote places yeah, are Yeah, like. so I think, you know, the Maasai is one of those, right, where we saw them up there. Um, 
the uh, cosmos in Tanzania is taking it. He's been taking it to some of them. Um, Sudan, right? We we talked about that before, where it's starting to go in Sudan. Um, you know, with some of the the refugees from the war there. And then um, Brian mentioned Evans going to Turkana, right? And just to give you context, like when he goes there, they say, oh, the Kenyans here. And he's like, well, you're Kenyan too. Like they don't know it, right? <laughs> they don't know that they're in Kenya, even though they are. Um, so, you know, it's like we're tr we have a part to play in that. Like God's not calling us to go yet. Yeah, he may at some point, you know, but like – when Evans goes there, like he, he went and um, staying in their house, and it was too hot for him. So they're like, all right, you can go sleep outside. He had to sleep on a mat. He's, like, afraid of snakes. And then, like, you know, they, they wake him up in the, in the middle of the night. But my, my point is, like, God, he may have us do that, but they're doing it. We're training them, and they're running with it. And so it's like this, this is where I was getting at before. Like, this is just working. Like it's, it's, everybody has a part to play. It's just working. Like, my, like I, I could not see Brian going there and sleeping on a mat. No, you know, no. it, it, that's just not going to happen. I could like, see Michael though. Maybe, maybe, maybe God will send me Michael. Yeah, yeah, maybe, but, but that could not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my point is that's not what he's supposed to do. Right. He's got a part to play. Dad has a part to play. You have a part to play. Everybody has a unique part to play in it. And so, for Evans, he's wired that way. He can go. It's still hard for him. Like you would think, like, oh, okay, it's easy for him. No, it's like it's it's still challenging for him to go. Um, but anyway, just you know, it's, an, it, it's it's great to see that this is going where no one else is. No one is going. You know, it's kind of um, it's like back in the day when the gospel was going into Africa, they haven't even heard of any, you know, like it's kind of like, wow, this is kind of neat. Not only are we going there, but there's a discipling and a maturing happening as well. Uh, one thing about Thursday, it was the most spiritually resisted day by far. Um, you, you could feel spiritual resistance. Um, I, I believe that the enemy one of his top priorities in spiritual warfare is to stop the bride of Christ from being made ready um, because just basic, basically he knows when the bride's made ready, the Lord will return and his end will come in Revelation 20. And you could just feel the resistance to, it wasn't from them, it was more just the demonic resistance to it. And, uh, you know, I remember that night we, uh, Michael and dad said I, I exaggerated on Friday when I told the guys about it, but um on Friday, on that Thursday night, I, we were all pretty discouraged. Um, we were all yeah, discouraged. We were, yeah. We yeah, were. Yeah. We were discouraged. And uh, so we, we, I know you probably got the text or the phone call, hey, pray, you know, they're, they're encountering resistance, pray, pray, pray. Um, and, you know, the next day we really felt we got a breakthrough related to that message. So that, that, was, that was very good. Really saw on Friday, um, I, I felt the need, okay, to, to review what we talked about. And I think after that, after your prayers, I think we broke through and they, they really got it. They really did get it. And then we taught on uh, indwelling life and we explained the new strategy. Uh, there were no questions, which is like, wow, okay, that's, that's amazing. Um, so that went really well. I don't know if you guys want to say anything else about Friday. Uh, well, we, we presented the process the Friday yeah. afternoon. So that, yeah. We'll uh, Saturday, Saturday, you could just tell, okay, everyone's like, okay, okay, let's bring this to an end. We've had enough. <laughs> but Saturday, we preached on, uh, Michael preached on the cross. It was really good. And then Dad talked about eternal purpose prayer, and we practiced praying. And then uh, that, that afternoon, I filmed about, for, from about 2 to 5, or 2 to, yeah, 2 to 5, I um, filmed uh, about nine different testimonies of our leaders and just just sat in awe of what God is doing through life school. Um, we're going to turn that into like a, a pretty good video to just help people understand this is what God's doing after 20 years. Um, it was very encouraging. Then maybe, Dad, you could share about the banquet we had at Midlands, or yeah, maybe you want to share. Was, was Saturday when we talked about the technology, or was that Sunday? Uh, that was Sunday. Oh, uh, I'll wait no, then. No, no, it was Saturday. It was Saturday. Saturday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we... Um, Again, you know, Kenya or 
of places. You have the places that are remote that don't have any internet, um, but then they have places like Mombasa where it's in, in Nakuru where it's very strong. And you know, when we first got there, we were we were kind of blown away at how much how advanced Kenya had become in just a short period of time. For example, they the, they had built a highway that it was a toll road, but it was like you know come before. You're like hit or miss getting to the airport because the traffic was so bad. But they had this, uh, like China came in and built this like massive highway. Um, and then just like the buildings there, um, some of you may know these companies, some of you may not, but like uh, like Oracle's a really big tech company, they're there. And Deloitte is a consulting firm, they're there, you know, Price Waterhouse. And so you're seeing all this investment coming in um, and everybody has cell phones, right? Um, and even going to the grocery store, it was like, I feel like this is like decorated like a grocery store in America, you know? Um, and so we were encouraged because it's like, wow, this is going to make things a lot easier, the distribution. And so we started, um, Brian and I started thinking about, uh, you know, the next kind of evolution of our tech you know the technology behind Life School, and, in, and to, to create an app like an i like an Android or an iPhone app. Um, you know, so we were kind of the whole you know the trip, kind of talking about it. Um, we talked to a few of the people there. Um, like, hey, what do you think about this? They're like, oh yes, we want that. We we want, we want that. We want that. So Saturday we had a little kind of strategy meeting about it, where we talked about it, and it got, I think, overwhelmingly people want it, right? Um, but there was some stuff lost in translation where they thought that we were giving everybody iPhones. Um, so <laughs> we had to clarify. Um, yeah. or, but One of the main reasons we need that app is because uh, Moses told us this. If you want to hide the truth from an African, put it in a book because they don't like to read. That's a, that's a, a, a very common saying there. If you want to hide the truth from an African, put it in a book. They don't like to read. So having the messages on audio where they can listen to it would really help them get the, the message deeper in their heart. So that's one of the reasons why uh, we need that app. We want to try to work on that app. Okay, maybe you can talk about the Midland Banquet if you want to say yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, on Saturday night, we wanted to kind of have a time of celebration. So we had a banquet there at the hotel where we were staying at. And it, uh, it was really nice. They did it up really good with a buffet. Uh, dinner and uh, so that was really a special time of just uh, they were they blessed us with some gifts and thanks and uh, things like that and we you know had some word, good words to say and one of the things that we really wanted to do um, uh, you know Ishmael Wagongo was the primary contact we had had uh, to get started in back in 2003 I met him through Bill and Rosalie Furler in 2002, and he was happened to be in uh, Tennessee at the time, and Donna and I went up there to meet him, and uh, so he organized the first conference at the Cool Shade Hotel in 2003, and was the leader there for a number of years, and he passed away sometime after 2018 with liver cancer, uh, and so we really wanted to uh, to to just say thanks to his wife Karen uh, for all that they did to help us get started and so but we tried we couldn't get in touch with her and she was um, you know we emailed her and had I uh, had Moses we had Moses contact her try to contact her and never could get in touch with her but anyway one day during the week uh, we were going back to the room at the Midlands Hotel. And she happened to be there for some other reason, and she saw me from a distance and thought, oh, is that Ken? And so she contacted Moses, and um, anyway, we actually got to meet, got to spend a few minutes with her, because she was there, and we were there just by, I mean, I was to say coincidence, but it was really God's uh, plan, we know. And so we had a time to really be there and, you know, just really have some 15, 20 minutes of real good conversation with her. But she was not going to be able to, she wasn't going to be in town for the con for the banquet. But um, anyway, we arranged for her, uh, three of her children to come. Uh, so they came and 
before that, uh, Doug had donated a necklace that uh, we wanted to give to her. So uh, we had that, and so we gave, we were able to give that to the to the kids to give to her uh, at the banquet. And so that was really special, just to say thanks. You know, 20 years, and and they were no longer involved in life school, but they did a lot to help it get started in those early years. So we were able to give that and just say some words of how much we appreciated that for the, to the kids, and they were able to communicate it to Karen. So that was kind of a special time there. Yeah. And then, you know, the um, afterwards, they, they honored Dad for, you know, all his 20, I guess, 20 years there, right? Um, just for example, when we were, oh, I got a couple of things, but when we were on our way to the safari, we stopped at this store, it was massive. It had like, I mean, souvenirs galore. You know, and they're like, oh, is this your first time to Kenya? And he's like, no, that's my 14th. And they're like, whoa, you know, <laughs> kind of taken back, like, um, wow, 14 times. But I think it just shows you just the amount of labor that dad has done and, and the team, you know, um, you know, the prayers too, just the, the sewing over the years, the sewing. Um, you know, it was one thing I was really blessed by, the amount of people on our team there who call him dad. You know, they don't call him Ken, they call him dad. And he's a spiritual father to them. Like, they, they, they literally, like, they, they, it's like he's their own children, you know? Um, and it's, it's such a, like, it's, it's just awesome to see. It's not a, it's a relational thing, right? It's not... And, and just to see the, the impact that he's had on their life. Um, and just notice, and we may have said this before, but, you know, Ken, yeah, you know, it's like, you got, you got oh, wow. you know. Wow, Ken, yeah. Ken, yeah. You know what that, yeah means? What does it mean? I don't know. Uh, it, anything? It probably means something. Yeah, it Ken, or yeah. maybe it's Ken, yeah. Ken, yeah, right. yeah, wow. I didn't think about that. I thought he was uh, one, one thing yeah. about calling dad, I mean, that's also a generic term for old man, too. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, do, I, I do, receive but, it as a spiritual father. Yeah, they do. I know it. They yeah. do. I, a lot of them do yeah. think of that. Yeah. So, yeah. I think they call you dad because they're, you, they I see know, you as a spiritual know. father. Okay. Last day, Sunday, um, uh, it, it, the Lord the Lord gave, the Lord gave, woke me up. I, it was one of those things you wait. I woke up before I left between 3.30 and 4, and I immediately had this thought, I need to teach on being a faithful witness. And the Lord, I just had this spiritual thought immediately, teach on 2 Peter chapter 2, but reverse it, because 2 Peter chapter 2 is about false prophets, false teachers, reverse it to be what a faithful witness is. So anyway, I won't go through all the details on that, but uh, really, I felt like the Lord wanted me to really, really challenge them to be faithful witnesses. Me too, me too, not just them, but it was challenging to me too. Um, and, you know, the importance of, you know, living by the Spirit, being a servant, speaking the truth without manipulation, handling money with integrity, having sound doctrine, becoming the message, those kind of things. Uh, the importance of being a faithful witness, not just going out there and speaking, but being inwardly true as a messenger. Um, and, you know, you could feel the fear of the Lord came into the room. Um, and then, you know, we had a, and you, maybe you can share the other. Yeah. And, then, um, and after that, I mean, it was definitely a, a very, very powerful message. Uh, and uh, it did bring the fear of the Lord. Uh, and so we were prepared. The next thing we did in that service was to take communion. Uh, we had brought some of those, you know, pre-done communion cups and we were going to take communion. Uh, and so we had a, an, an opportunity to le lead, uh, allow them to repent of anything, you know, financial issues and stuff like that that might hinder them from going forth. And we said, you know, we, you don't need to share it with us. I mean, if you want to, you can, but you don't have to. But repent of anything and let's put it under the blood by taking communion. So we did that uh, because we wanted to go forth with a clean slate if there was any issues, you know, and there's a lot of, so much poverty there. I'm sure there was some uh, of that, but anyway, the, we took communion, uh, and then the next thing that we did, because one of the, one of the things the Lord said is that with this conference, there was a shift in responsibility. 
where for the first 20 years, we were the ones responsible for multiplying the message there, and they were helping us facilitate that. But with this conference, the, the responsibility shifted, and we had already talked about all this, where they now are responsible for, Kenya, for Africa, uh, and we are facil helping to facilitate them. So it's a huge shift of responsibility. And the Lord told me to take a baton, uh, you know, like a track baton. So I, I did that, and we passed the baton uh, to them and uh, brought the leadership team up, and then we, uh, you know, had them each touch it, and then we gave it to, to them to, to hold. So we did that. That was the second thing. I mean, the next thing that we did was pass the baton. And then after that, we, um, Brian Both brought the book that we had signed several years ago. No, it's a different one. Oh, a different yeah. book. Okay, a different book. Okay. He brought the book, a book, and we had them to sign it. We did weaken, you know, originally we were planning to make it to the level of seriousness that we took when we were doing that, but we really felt like, you know, because we don't want to put them in uh, such, you know, where there's such consequences before the Lord if they can't f finish. So we, we made it where they were committing to going through the training to become not a Bible distributor, but a messenger. Uh, and so they signed, the, 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 we, we talked about it. They didn't sign it until afterwards at the end of the service. But we talked about that. And then we uh, prayed for uh, each and every one, every, every one of them, laid hands on them and prayed for them, for the spirit and power of Elijah, uh, impartation, or whatever the Lord wanted to do there. And then they came up and signed the book after that. So, um, yeah, so. yeah, so that was... Uh that was the trip. Um, we got five more days we want to share. We're going to go into explicit detail of the yeah. flight home, the food. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so I don't know if y'all have any closing thoughts or things to uh, say in closing. I think I like airline food better than y'all do, Air, airplane food. He does. He likes airline food better than we do. Me and Michael were like, I ain't touching that stuff. And Dad was like, ooh, scrambled eggs. And well, we had an apple <laughs> apple crate, a pork sausage link, and a fruit cup on oh, the way back from Paris. It's not it wasn't good. that bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. One funny thing, on the way there, like, Brian and I, we love coffee. And, and we're like, man, I can't wait. We're going to Paris airport. We're gonna have such an amazing cup of coffee and like this croissant. This is gonna be so amazing, you know. Right before we go into into Africa, and we land, and we're like, "Oh, there's a coffee place." And we go, and it's like, "This is disgusting." It was, you know? so, it was bad. so bad. And like, I found another place, but then Brian comes back with Starbucks, and we're like, "Man, like Starbucks, Starbucks in, in Paris, in Paris, like, you know." Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was better on the way back. We found a better one. It was but, yeah, better on the way but, back. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Story. Uh, on the this is from Paris to Nairobi. Uh, we were we had booked exit row seats, you know, where you have like you could stretch your legs out and all that. But they changed the plane to a different kind of plane, so we were packed in with you know you like this, and the next seat is right there in front of you. And uh, Brian was behind this French guy. Uh, and you know, he, when he first got there, but he was probably in his like late seventies or something. Mid yeah. He was an old French yeah. guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> ordinary French guy. So anyway, Grumpy even when we first French got guy. in there, there, he, he put his over his suitcase or something in the overhead in, in a row ahead of us. And it, it was dripping some liquid onto these people and the other, the other people in front of us. Uh, and they all got into a kind of a fuss about it. Oh, we thought there was going to be some fight or something. Yeah, yeah. it's just, oh, it's just water. Don't worry about it. You know, and then they said, they were about to call the flight attendant, and they, they got into a fuss about it. But anyway, then after that, uh, you know, he was the flight was going on, and he leans back 
as far as he can. This is right in front of Brian. He leans back. It was hurting my knees. <laughs> I mean, my knees were bumping up against the thing without it leaning back. So Brian asked him if he would, would you please move your seat up a little bit? I don't have enough room. And he said, uh, he said to him, no, you, you should have. You should have booked a business flight class if you wanted to do that. This is my seat, and I'm going to do it. And so, anyway, the flight attendant got involved. I went and talked to the flight attendant and told her what was going on. And she came and started, she just chewed him out in French. I have no idea what she said. I don't know what she said, but she was, you know, she was really mean. And he still wouldn't budge. He still was like, no, I'm going to put my seat all the way back. So, anyway, they moved Brian to. There was an exit row that you couldn't sit on for some reason. I don't know. And so anyway, but they moved him there and let him sit there. So he had it was a pretty nice comfortable. comfortable. It was very nice, actually. Yeah, yeah. Michael, I struggled, you know, the yeah. rest of the flight. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we had an awesome time. Thank you so much, really, truly from our hearts. Thank you so much for all your prayers. Uh, you could really fill your prayers. Thank you for laboring the way you did, sacrificing your time, energy, uh, your schedule to stand in the gap and pray because it... it it makes all the difference in the world. Um, I, I think now, kind of the one's closing, I think now the way I feel is we've given birth to a massive, mature baby, and we have to support it and maintain this man-child that's been born, so to speak, through prayer and intercession. Um, you know, I think the best days of life school are ahead of us, but we've got to really, really, like Dad was talking about, Pray for, um, pray for this, these, this team to really make that transition. Um, and we've got to win the battle in prayer and intercession. I think we will, but yeah, but it's exciting. It's very, very incredible, exciting. Yeah, that's my final thoughts. Anything y'all want to say in closing? Uh, yeah, Amen. any any thoughts or questions anyone yeah, has? Like you said, I'll yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and stop it online. So we'll end it there online. Okay.